You know something that kinda sucks about League of Legends? There's only one game mode. Ranked Solo Queue on Summoner's Rift is the only game mode that we can play. Alright, alright, before you type your comment, obviously there are other game modes. There's normal games, there's flex queue, even blind pick that you can play on Summoner's Rift, and there's ARAM that you can play on The Howling Abyss. If you're more of a strategy game player, you can also play TFT. But have you ever wondered why there aren't any more permanent game modes? How come if you love Earth, you can only play it once or twice per year? How come if you like One For All, you can only play it right now, but you probably won't be able to play it this summer? Why isn't League of Legends like Rocket League, where there are alternate game modes that aren't nearly as popular as the base game, but still hold a permanent slot in the servers for you to play at your will? The truth is, there have been a lot of different and unique game modes to play throughout League history. Around 25 different modes. Most of the time, you're restricted to playing the three permanent game modes, and there have been some non-PVP modes as well. Back in 2017 and 2018, we had entire events designed around a PvE game mode, and we've seen nothing like it since. There were even two long-time permanent modes in Dominion and Twisted Treeline that have also been removed. Why? What in the world is happening here? This video is sponsored by my friends over at NordVPN. If you don't know what a VPN is, my first question is what rock do you live under? If you are aware of all of the advantages of a VPN, my second question is why aren't you using Nord right now? If you live in a country that's constantly blocking content for whatever reason, for example Australia's government regulations, Nord is a simple and easy way to get the content you want to see. How simple? Well, let me show you. It's literally just one click and boom, you're connected to the country of your choice. Not only will you be able to access the content, but you'll also have the peace of mind knowing that you're using the internet more privately by avoiding tracking and surveillance. Right now, you can go to nordvpn.com slash exil or use code exil to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. That's right, you get all of that just by using my code. Do it now and thanks again to Nord for sponsoring my content. This video is meant to cover many different topics, from the complete history of all of these game modes and events, to how the current rotating game mode system works, and why we keep getting them removed, why Riot doesn't allow them to be permanent, and the fun that we're missing out on, particularly when it comes to PvE modes, which I really enjoyed. But let's stay organized, and stay on track, and start with a sort of TLDR on all alternate game mode history. Let's go back, like way, way back to the very beginning of League of Legends. Riot did not plan to restrict the game to 5v5 Summoner's Rift. Summoner's Rift was indeed the first and main map in the game, and it was by far the most important game mode to the developers and the player base, but did you know that in the old champion spotlights way back then, they actually included strategies and builds for other game modes too? They intended for the mechanics of this game, all of the champions and the abilities to be used for more than just fighting over your red buff on Summoner's Rift, or securing Dragon, or laning top lane. And for nearly 5 years, there was a mode called Dominion on the Crystal Scar. It was a 5v5 game based around capturing points and controlling objectives. Of course, after an entire decade, they also retired the Twisted Tree Line. Now, these two modes, despite reaching the same exact ending by being removed from the game, got there in a much different way. Dominion was far less popular than Twisted Tree Line, particularly the original Twisted Tree Line, which is why it existed for much less time. The balance on Dominion was a lot harder to get right, and the scoring system was unintuitive and questionable at best. Even though it was 5v5, the gameplay differed substantially from Summoner's Rift, and Twisted Tree Line, although it was only a 3v3 game mode, the core gameplay was a lot closer to that of Summoner's Rift. It had jungle camps, it had lanes, it had a neutral boss that was sort of like Baron, and generally speaking, a trio of champions that would have good synergy on Summoner's Rift, like Malphite, Yasuo, and Orianna, could serve as a good team comp for Twisted Tree Line. 
There were people who liked Dominion, and with League of Legends being the most populated game in the world, it's understandable that thousands and thousands of people enjoyed it, but that's far less than the tens of millions who played Summoner's Rift. In the last few years of its life, the Twisted Tree line had a strong but still small community and had a similar ranking system to Summoner's Rift where you could reach Challenger on TT, but it suffered immensely from a botting problem. The reason these two game modes eventually were removed isn't completely understood since we don't work for Riot, but speculations of course start with money. These two game modes compared to Summoner's Rift were just pitiful in terms of player base. It can be frustrating that one of the richest companies in the world wouldn't want to keep the lights on for a game mode like Twisted Tree Line just because it wasn't profitable, but that's the world we live in. We know they're scummy, what huge corporation and huge gaming companies aren't. Another important thing is that neither of these modes saw any real updates or maintenance which left them underwhelming and feeling less polished. The Twisted Tree Line's downfall started around 9 years ago when it actually received a huge update, a full re-release and rework in October of 2012. Before 2012, the original Twisted Tree Line was actually kinda sweet, and it was even more popular than the version that existed for over 7 years. They changed everything about this map. They made the map much smaller, they removed warding, they added altars and capturing points just like Dominion, and it changed the layout and the dynamic of the gameplay. The community didn't really like these changes, and it never saw the same player base that the original did. So a big question is why in the world did they rework it, and how come they didn't revert it? A full revert for the map was pretty unlikely since they spent a lot of time improving the graphics and making it look substantially nicer, bringing it up to modern standards for the time in 2012. I mean, the old Twisted Tree Line looked like it was made in MS Paint, and of course they spent tons of development time on this rework, so again, bringing it back to the exact same thing was pretty unlikely. The reason they did the massive update in the first place was because of one key issue with the old map. The games were really long and took forever to complete. It was easy to stall them out. Since the map was really big and the game mode was only 3v3, there weren't a lot of fights and even though it was super cool and unique, it was a little on the boring side. The biggest thing they wanted to do was to increase the amount of fights and speed up the pace of play. And while they did do that, they failed in basically every other way. The original map had tons of interesting things. It had a green buff and a white buff, and a dragon buff gained from killing the dragon called Ebon Maw. The idea of a dragon buff wouldn't even come to Summoner's Rift until 2015. Almost immediately, it was obvious that this was not as popular as the original Twisted Tree Line, and they would leave it to rot, barely updating it over the next 7 years. By the very end, less than 1% of the total League of Legends player base actually played Twisted Tree Line. Does anyone even play this game mode? Estimated wait times 4 minutes. Normal blind pick Twisted Tree Line? Estimated wait 4 minutes. How? Alright, now before we begin talking about all of the rotating game modes, there's one more thing that we need to talk about, which is the most successful non-Summoner's Rift 5v5 mode, ARAM. These days, ARAM is an always available mode played on the Howling Abyss. It is significantly more casual, faster paced, and easier to understand what's going on. Everybody goes down one lane and picks a fight. You push to the enemy nexus, there's no neutral objectives, no jungler, you can't even pick your champion. I think the beauty of ARAM lies in its simplicity. In a lot of ways, it's a more pure form of League of Legends. Everyone just throws their abilities at each other and sees what happens. The fact that your champion is random makes it less boring and repetitive, and it helps to alleviate the number of overpowered picks, because ARAM as a map has some champions that just thrive. A champion like Varus or Lux will instantly become stronger now that they have a huge range advantage while poking, and everybody is in a much more clustered area. Not being able to reach call back to base in ARAM also makes it so eventually you will lose your health bar to long range poke. It's just a matter of time. What's interesting about ARAM is that it did not start as a structured, well thought out mode. To this day, it remains as the only official game mode made by Riot that started as a community custom game. ARAM was introduced as an official queue type in 2012, but before that there were actually ARAM games being played, although sort of underground. Players would promise in a custom game to pick a random champion and go mid, straight up A-ramming it. You know where the name comes from. All random, all mid. 
Of course, the issue lies that not everybody would follow these rules, and there would be trolls that would ruin the custom games and waste everyone's time, but it still remained a popular thing to do. Later on with the release of the Dominion game mode and the Crystal Scar map, a variant of the ARAM Summoner's Rift custom game would become a little more popular on the new Crystal Scar, this time all random, all bot. The Dominion version of this custom game made it a little bit better. You started with more gold, there were Dominion altars to capture on the bottom side of the map, you could use bushes, and you gained the Dominion buff to speed up the pace of play. The Summoner's Rift ARAM customs could go on forever. Back then, the game had huge death timers, particularly early game, but the Dominion all random all bot was much faster. In 2012, after months and months of players begging for Riot to make ARAM an official game mode, they would deliver. There was a tutorial map way back in the day called The Proving Grounds, and it would serve as a quick introduction to League of Legends, showing you the mechanics, explaining how the game works, but the cool thing is that it only had one lane, making it perfect for ARAM. They would reuse this asset, and The Proving Grounds map became the official home for ARAM, and for one year, it was an official game mode. Then, in 2013, Riot redesigned the Proving Grounds map and made the Howling Abyss the official map that is still used today. Right now, the League of Legends rotating game mode queue is what we're all used to when it comes to these game modes, and at the time of recording, we can play one for all. It goes through a cycle of what games are available, but the sad thing is that we never get anything new anymore. In 2018, Riot stopped releasing the rotating game mode queue every single patch. You see, we always used to have at least one mode available to play 24-7, but now the release schedule is more sporadic. The reason that we no longer see any brand new rotating game modes, nor do we see them used all of the time, is because of teamfight tactics, although we will address that later on in the video. But before we get there, let's go through the entire history of all alternate game modes. 2013 and 2014 were the first two seasons in which we saw some limited time modes to mess around with. As a part of a year in review reflection piece on the forums, Riot told us even six years ago that these modes were never designed to be long term. Even that long ago, from the onset, it was their idea that these additional modes were supposed to be short bursts of fun and unique experiences, using all of the League of Legends mechanics, and then poof, they're gone. The rioter who wrote this forum post was Riot Latency, and he gives some very important context here. He says the main design concern, which is most important, is that the featured gameplay modes are not designed to be long-term engagement experiences. They're designed to make a big splash, with the knowledge that they will be removed shortly thereafter. Adding permanency would constrain the design wiggle room we have to make each mode as unique as possible. As we've since learned, it would also add additional balance and maintenance cost that we'll share some examples of later on in this retro. He goes on to explain that in order for these modes to work in the long term, they would have to attempt to fix their problems or even balance them, and that is really hard because they're supposed to have problems. Even with these game modes never being designed to be permanent, they are still some of the most fun and interesting parts of League of Legends history, so let's go ahead and move on into the list, starting with one of the first ever game modes being Hexakill. This mode has seen several variants on both Summoner's Rift and the Twisted Tree line. This is essentially regular League of Legends, but instead of being 5v5, it's 6v6. In this mode, it also becomes possible to score a new highest kill feed, a Hexakill, which obviously is not possible normally. We haven't seen Hexakill actually for quite a while now, coming on a couple of years. However, back at the time in 2014, Riot seemed fairly satisfied with its first launch, which is why later that same year we would see it again, and then again in 2014 we would see it, as well as a new version on the Twisted Tree line. What a lot of people enjoyed about this game mode is that that one extra person brings an entire new dynamic to the strategy of the game. Having one extra person means you could either duo top, duo mid, trio bot, or even have two junglers. The next featured mode on this list would end up becoming the most popular one they had ever made and released, and the ironic thing is that it was only ever meant to be a joke. On April Fool's Day of 2014, a mode called Ultra Rapid Fire was meant to be out for just that one day. Turns out though, it was fun as heck. 
Needless to say, Riot was blown away by the community feedback and the number of players who loved it, so they would extend the timeline on the original Earth past just the one day that they had planned. Earth ended up being around for a couple of weeks. This game type is basically completely normal League of Legends on Summoner's Rift 5v5, except the dial is turned up to maximum overdrive. Your abilities now have 80% cooldown reduction and no longer cost any mana or energy. Over the many different iterations of Earth throughout all of the years of it being a thing, it's seen a couple of improvements. The original version in 2014 was Earth at its most vanilla form, but later on down the road we saw all random Earth where you were assigned a random champion, which was pretty helpful because of the massive amounts of Sona and AP jack spam, and nowadays Earth always comes with a fountain cannon. This cannon speeds up the pace of play even more, with walking back to lane no longer being required. You just hop in the cannon, pick where you want to go, and boom, you're in the action. The rounds will last anywhere from 10 to 25 minutes, with the average I'd say being somewhere around 15 minutes. This game mode also has a specific buff that champions get, which is pretty interesting. You can move a little faster, crits deal additional damage, everyone gets tenacity, stuff like that. What I personally find most interesting about Earth is that some champions go from being kind of bad to straight up overpowered beyond reason in Earth. Even if Sona isn't that great in the current League of Legends meta, she will always be a staple overpowered pick in Earth because her kit loses her two main weaknesses. A champion who is most heavily gated by mana costs and cooldowns no longer needs to worry about mana costs and cooldowns, so she becomes top tier. Another fun thing about Earth is that there's some builds that are crazy and would not work whatsoever on normal Summoner's Rift, but can happen here in Earth. A very popular one is something like Fast Jin. Jin's speed build has seen countless YouTube videos go viral and been played by millions and millions of people in Earth. You can reach ungodly levels of movement speed due to Jin's interaction with stat scaling on his passive. Ultra Rapid Fire becomes available a couple of times per year, and during that period is widely played by both hardcore and casual players. What started as a joke turned out to be their best work. The next mode on the list sits in a very similar category to Earth, being significantly more popular than a lot of the other modes, and it's been enjoyed steadily for nearly 8 years since it first appeared back in 2013. One for All or OFA makes every champion on a team the same, but the key thing is that you don't know who the enemy picked when your team picks. It's a blind pick setup that usually works on a voting system for a little bit of randomness. Some champions are insanely good on this mode, and and others are quite poor. The ideal champ pick would be one with a lot of CC that you can easily stack out the enemy team with and they simply can't move until they die, or a champion that can build a hybrid setup. Champions that rely on only one type of damage can easily be countered by stacking resistances. While it's true that 5 pantheons have a lot of CC and a ton of roaming potential, if the enemy stacks armor, there's almost nothing he can do about it. One for All Just Like Earth comes back a couple of times per year and is a lot of fun to play. Personally, the thing I found the hardest to play against in this mode is things like Taric, Malphite, and Yasuo. Heading back to the Crystal Scar, this was the first ever non-Summoner's Rift rotating game mode to be featured, which was called Ascension. To be quite honest with you, I almost feel like Ascension was more popular than Dominion, which is kind of funny if you think about it. In Ascension, there was a buff that a champion could receive in order to become a god. This map had a Xerath in the middle, and by killing him, it allowed the player to ascend. When ascended, you gained significantly overpowered buffs, and once a strong carry was ascended, it became you and your team's job to protect them and help them wipe the enemy team. The Crystal Scar itself was also a little different. There was a sandstorm that rolled through the map reducing vision, and in order to enter the map you had to take a portal. You couldn't actually walk on foot in order to get to the map. There were also something called Relics of Shirima that when captured would provide vision over the area in the top right, top left, and lower center regions of the map. They also gave a movement speed buff to the team who controlled those points. This mode was pretty fun to be honest with you. Dominion and the Crystal Scar were retired in 2016, but the assets for the map would still be used for the Ascension game mode over the next year or two, however we now know that Ascension was officially retired and will likely never come back per a post by Riot around two years ago. This is genuinely a shame to me because this is one of the game modes I enjoyed a lot with my friends. It was fun to be a Vayne or a Kog'Maw and become Ascended and have you and your team protect them and help them carry.
We all know that League of Legends is a PvP game, and unless you're talking about co-op versus AI, which is essentially a joke, every mode is PvP. But over the years, we've had a couple of different modes be PvE, and the first one ever was Doombots. Doombots were first introduced in 2014, and this is one of the fondest memories I have of League of Legends. What made this so enjoyable at the time is that there was just nothing like this that Riot had ever made. These bots were broken and overpowered. They could throw eight of their abilities in every single direction. The bots would actually mutate over the course of the game as well, and they started picking up abilities from other champions. These buffs that they would get were called curses, and this is a list of all of the possible mutations that they could get. Some of these mutations are completely crazy. They would start opening rise portals underneath you to try to teleport you into their team like some sort of rise insect, and they would also make your own turrets start to zap you. Wow. An interesting fact about Doombots is that one of the most popular League of Legends videos ever featured this game mode. In July of 2014, the LOL Esports channel posted a video titled Warning, the Doombots have invaded the machines. In this video, they put the North American LCS casters in a match up against the Doombots and their comms and ragtag coordination was pretty funny to watch. To this day, this video has racked up over 6 million views on YouTube. The only problem with the original Doombots is although they were extremely powerful and people thought they were very challenging to beat at first, at the end of the day, bots are still bots. They would make a lot of mistakes and sometimes do very dumb things like proxy a wave or not defend their base, and it was possible to cheese them and beat them. This made Riot rethink the Doombots a little bit, which is why for the next event, things would go a little differently. Doombots would make a return in 2016 for the Little Devil Teemo event, and the cool thing about this version of the Doombots is that you could pick their difficulty, from levels 1 to 100. In this mode called the Gauntlet, the level 100 bots were pretty crazy. This time, you didn't need to necessarily even destroy the nexus of the bots, but rather survive long enough until you face the final objective. Giant Teemo. Giant Devil Teemo would start to walk towards your base. He was super beefy and tough to kill. Once you beat him though, it would end the game for your team. It would take a couple of days, but eventually, yes, there were people that beat the level 100 Doombots. One trick that I found interesting at the time was using Scion, as it appears the bots didn't really understand what to do against his passive. They would still fight him and throw stuff at him, but it still looked a little off, almost like they didn't know he was in his passive. It always seems to be the case with these PvE modes that because they were designed to be more of a gimmick and not super polished as a true PvE experience, you could still cheese the game's terrible bot AI. To wrap up 2014, we saw the appearance of ARAM's first official mix-up, Legend of the Poro King. This mode added an additional objective to the default ARAM format where you need to hit enemies with snowballs and after your team or the enemy team reaches 10 hits, you can then summon the Poro King. He will barrel down the lane as essentially a beefed up siege minion, giving the team a big push advantage. You also get to pick your champion in this mode, so it's not completely like ARAM where the champion you get is random. You're also given two summoner spells when playing this mode, one being the snowball itself and the other being a dash. The dash allows you to use an infinite range dash to the Poro King if your team has him summoned. This is a great way to keep up the pressure while pushing with him if you die. This mode uses ARAM's balancing settings as well, so everything else will feel just like ARAM except with the King and the lack of other summoner spells. The few times that I've played this mode throughout League history, I remember champions like Shaco and Katarina being a lot of fun to pick. People always get low from all of the fighting just like they normally do in ARAM, but in this case you can use the Poro King teleport to get back into the action if you die, and then reset on everyone who's low and easily get a pentakill. It's been a while since we've seen the Poro King mode, but this mode hasn't been officially retired by Riot, I'm sure that we'll either see it by the end of the year or soon after that. In the summer of 2015 to help celebrate the Gangplank rework, a pirate themed mode that was played on 5v5 Summoner's Rift would first be available to play for a few weeks and then never return. The mode was called Black Market Brawlers. This game had a new twist to the Summoner's Rift map, allowing players to earn and spend a new currency called Kraken. This could then be used to upgrade minions. These brawler minions would replace regular minions and spawn in every wave for the rest of the game once you bought them. 
It also had a host of new items to try out, most of which were blatantly overtuned on purpose in order to be pretty fun. Take the item Trickster's Glass for example, which allowed you to take a copy of an enemy champion, almost like Nico but for the enemy team, and become them for 30 seconds. Something very cool about this mode is that it served as a sort of testing ground for a couple of new items, and it turned out to be that a few items would later be added into the main game. Deadman's Plate immediately after the mode's end would be added to Summoner's Rift in 2015, and there was even a version of Staff of Flowing Water in here, an item which of course is now in the game with the Season 11 item rework. With the end of the Gangplank rework and Bilgewater event saw the final days of the Black Market Brawlers game. It was pretty cool to see the idea of upgrading minions be dedicated to this game mode, but sadly this idea has never been healthy for League of Legends. We all know what happened with Banner of Command and ZZ Rot Portal. If we fast forward an entire year, we get to the summer of 2016. This time, we saw League of Legends not as a game of both offense and defense played at the same time, but rather a turn-based attacking and defending team. Nexus Siege was very interesting, as it would cut Summoner's Rift in half. If your team was attacking, you would try your best to shove waves and deploy upgraded siege minions to destroy towers. If you were defending, you could break out some tower upgrades and hold the line at all costs. The rounds would end either when the attackers broke the nexus or after 15 minutes. The winner was determined by the fastest time to destroy the nexus. Nexus Siege actually had a lot of unique content, things like turret buffs, summoner spells, extra siege minions to spawn and summon, and much like black market brawlers, an additional currency to earn this time called crystal shards. Earning these shards allowed you to make the upgrades. Although this is just my personal opinion, I think the reason this mode has never really come back and wasn't that popular is because attacking and defending modes never really felt right on League for me, and I'd consider this mode to be one of if not the worst ones they've ever made. No offense. It wasn't so much that there was nothing interesting happening here, because for me, I think the idea of having a half map and a constant action based mode is pretty cool, but the idea of attacking and defending just throws off League of Legends entirely. League is kind of at its best when someone can bait the enemy team into playing too aggressive, only to then become the aggressor themselves. Sometimes what might look like passive play to the untrained eye is actually just the correct play. For me, League of Legends is so cool because there isn't actually such a thing as true passivity or true aggression. That's more of a myth or a way of explaining skill in a simpler term. What's more accurate is that there are correct and incorrect plays. Sometimes you have to give up CS, and other times you should make the enemy miss CS. But because this type of mode was just barreling down a lane mindlessly if you're attacking with the only option being to push, it would make attacking frustrating and defending kind of boring. Either way, we haven't seen this mode for a very long time, and it's unlikely that we will see it again since they've confirmed that this is one of the retired modes. Early on into Season 7, a new round of Blood Moon skins were released. These are some of my favorite skins ever, particularly the Diana skin, but also the Jin skin just has such a good splash art. To celebrate this event, a new game mode called Hunt of the Blood Moon would hit the live servers. This was one of those one-time wonder modes, and it was only ever meant to be live during this Blood Moon event. It was played on a Blood Moon Aesthetic Summoner's Rift, where it was the first ever mode to use a limited champion pool. You were only allowed to play Assassins, but for some reason a few questionable champions like Elise, Pantheon, Kennen, and Camille were allowed. Not sure how those champions are Assassins, but anyway. This mode was a fast-paced version of League of Legends, and it was basically Team Deathmatch. The game started with no outer turrets, and at the 6 minute mark the inner turrets would collapse as well. Lane minions would no longer spawn, and turrets were invulnerable. Gold and experience were flatlined, and respawn timers were reduced across the board. You also couldn't buy most defensive items from the shop, which meant that you couldn't play something like Tank Echo in this assassin-based mode. The way that you won was by earning 350 50 points, and there were three ways to earn points. One was to kill an enemy champion, which granted 5 points. Another was to kill an enemy spirit, which granted 3 points. These were spirits of the Blood Moon that would passively spawn and kind of run around the jungle. Finally, Demon Heralds would also periodically spawn, which were replacements for Dragon and Baron, and those granted 25 points on kill. 
This mode was exactly what you would expect it to be. It was fun, fast, and a crapshoot of assassins running around playing team deathmatch, which meant that it was exciting for a couple of games, but the lack of coordination and minimal strategy wouldn't keep people playing for very long. I think the base idea here is very cool, reducing respawn timers and actually having no minions, so maybe they could redo that someday to include either more champions or a different class of champions. They could potentially do something with a mage only mode or a tank only mode, maybe even marksman. Oh, speaking of marksman, let's talk about their mode. In November of 2017, Project Overcharge released, and this was an entirely new map located in the streets of Project City. This project event came with two new ADC skins for Jin and Vayne, so making a marksman-only game mode for Riot just made sense. Project Overcharge was deceptively simple, and quite honestly, I found it a little hard to understand at first. The map was very interactive with a bunch of teleporters and these surveillance nodes, and there were no rune pages, you had some modifications to your damage and base stats, and there was this mechanic called Overcharge, which was sort of like being ascended, but ultimately didn't give the same godlike fantasy since it only lasted for 25 seconds and it applied to your entire team. Even with Overcharge being a little bit weird, I enjoyed this one quite a bit, because this style of map was significantly different than anything we've ever seen in League before. It was really small with a lot of choke points, a ton of corners, and a bunch of ways to juke and outplay your opponents, and it made it feel more like a Call of Duty map. Similar to Hunt of the Blood Moon, you could only buy offensive items, and due to the complicated map, it was enjoyable to try to coordinate actual team fighting and strategy, with League of Legends being shrunk down to such a small scale. In every other game mode, we are used to lane-wide fighting with huge areas to cover and massive zone control around neutral objectives, but this was more like hide and seek. I think it's a shame that we didn't get to play this for an additional time because maybe with some fine tuning, they could actually have a better purpose, not just killing each other and killing the robots that are scattered around, it might have been more engaging. We've now reached the most exciting part of the video for me personally, as this game mode is one of my favorites ever. I easily played this for 30 to 50 games and stayed up till 3 or 4 in the morning sometimes when it first came out because it was just that fun for me. The Dark Star Thresh game. This was all action, no BS. It was complete arcade gameplay. There was no farming, no items to buy, no runes, nothing. Just a very fun core concept. The object of the game was to push the enemy team into the singularity in the middle of the map. It sounds very simple and unimpressive when you say it like that, but trust me, it was sick. The map was completely separate and something we've never seen before and has never been reused either and it was designed for this 3v3 setup. Everyone would play as Thresh and the mode exaggerated his normal abilities, designing everything around the best parts of his kit. By pressing Q, you could throw your normal hook, except it had infinite range to pull enemies closer to the center and deal some damage to them. Doing damage was important because the lower health you were, the further you would get knocked back or pulled. If you threw your hook through the center of the star and hit someone, it did bonus damage and would pull them even further. There were other things around the map to hook too, there were these posts that you could use to reposition yourself across the map and either escape with a sick juke or get deep into the enemy team. There were also scuttle crabs that you could flay into the middle of the map as well, which instead of giving you 5 points, would just give you 1 point. You could learn to prioritize both farming the crabs and killing champions. The game would be played in a best of 3 format, with each round going up to 100 points, but the entire match would last less than 10 to 15 minutes. Darkstar was all about making the sickest plays possible. You could save your allies with a clutch lantern right as they're about to be killed. You could land clutch hooks. You could flay multiple enemies at the same time. For whatever reason, this was just the most fun thing they ever put in the game for me. I found it so incredibly enjoyable, and it's a total shame that we haven't seen it again. Now you might think we are all done with all of these modes, but there are actually two more that I would like to talk about, and I saved them last for a reason. Doombots was the first ever PvE mode in League of Legends as we talked about, but it's obviously not designed to be some separate mode that people would enjoy and love to play all the time. We can assume that they restructured the code of the AI that already existed, which we all know are kind of stupid. The bots make tons of mistakes and don't know how to stop you from pushing. However, in 2017 and 2018, we saw two proper PvE modes which deserved an entire section of this video to talk about. 
Star Guardian Invasion was the first of its kind released in August of 2017. It was a new take on League of Legends gameplay, showing the whole community that non-PVP can not only be really fun, but competitive and engaging. There were some real challenges here along with strategies to follow. Even on the normal difficulty, it was important to focus the Vel'Kozes on the edge of the map. If you left them unattended to keep firing missiles, it would stack up over the course of the round and eventually become impossible to dodge. It would be important to time your abilities with the mechanics of the wave spawning, such as Ezreal using his huge AoE ultimate as soon as the monsters are clumped up. What made this such a cool concept is that the base gameplay was kept completely intact. Ezreal played exactly like Ezreal and did roughly the same damage that you would assume Ezreal was going to do. Ari played exactly like Ari and her charm was as useful as always. All of the same items did all of the same things. It was just a natural extension of League of Legends into a PvE setting. The rate of raging and flaming in these fun modes would be vastly lower than PvP in Ranked because it was just good old fun. In one of his recent videos, Dunkey lays out some good points to the advantages of PvE versus PvP. In PvE, things are allowed to be overpowered and broken because you don't have to worry about making the AI rage quit while playing against it or posting to Reddit that, hey, Ezreal is broken. From what I can tell, co-op is the primary focus of Overwatch 2. Like I said before, the most interesting part of this game to me is the roster. You have all of these different characters with different play styles, and I think by focusing more on PvE, you can really get more creative with character abilities and making every hero feel broken in their own way. Remember when Overwatch first came out and Roadhog could hook players that were playing on different maps than him? He could throw that dumbass hook around corners and then once he pulled you in, he could just one-shot you. It was hilarious. It was awesome and it was insanely broken. What's nice about PvE is that you can allow characters to be broken and really focus on empowering the player. But these modes were not perfect. It was just too easy. Focusing the Vel'Kozes alone was a good enough strategy that a team of misfit bronze players could usually beat the hardest difficulty. There were tons of players that within a few days could optimize the round, detail the strategy, and post a guide about it, ruining the experimentation process for everyone. In the original Star Guardian Invasion, there were only two difficulties, and due to the lack of replayability, it makes sense why this was a temporary game mode. There simply wasn't enough content or rewards to make it worth playing more than like 10 times. But then again, one year later, it would return. This time, the PvE mode was called Odyssey Extraction, and it would hit the live servers in September of 2018, and this mode was playable not for a few weeks, but an entire month. What is so awesome is that most of the things that needed improvements from the Star Guardian mode would see upgrades here. There were only two difficulties? Well, now there's five. For the Odyssey mode, Onslaught difficulty was absolutely insane, and it would take me more than a dozen tries over the course of a week to even get close to beating it. What was also really cool is that beating Onslaught wasn't possible without some level of replayability, and the way that they achieved that was through augments. As you played more rounds of this thing, you began to unlock augments that you could apply to champions. These weren't just simple runes or masteries either, they were gameplay altering modifications. Yasuo could throw more than one tornado, Malphite could fly an infinite distance with his ultimate, pick up every enemy in the path, and then slam them into a wall. You could put together a bunch of different combinations of augments for each of the five champions, customizing your builds for a fun team composition, and even if you had already beat Onslaught with the most optimal setup, you could at least try to beat it with a whole new set of augments with a new strategy. Finally, the mode also had two unique summoner spells, using a revive mechanic that let you pick up fallen teammates, and warp, which was basically an upgraded flash that you could use multiple times to dodge abilities. At first, it seemed like this mode could have weeks or even months of replayability because everyone assumed the hardest difficulty would keep players coming back. But once again, we were a little bit wrong about that, because it didn't. Just as with Invasion, players would learn how to efficiently beat the mode. They could write up clear and concise cheesy moves that you could do in order to beat the AI, making it much easier to beat. Within the first week of Extraction going live, there were already guides on Reddit on how to beat the hardest difficulty. This sounds like Riot would fail, but just because this problem happened all over again, doesn't mean to me that Odyssey was a complete failure. 
The Star Guardian version of this PvE setting was awesome, but clearly was not intended to be more than a fun concept for a few rounds. Its primitive nature would work as a proof of concept, which Odyssey then sort of fully fleshed out. With these events, Riot really had something here. I'm not saying that either of these two events would ever be anywhere near as popular as PvP Summoner's Rift ranked. That's pretty clear that that would not be the case. But here's something that I think I could guarantee. With minor updates, different seasons, different rosters of champions, new maps every season, a set of new augments, and all of the changes that they usually make to teamfight tactics by the way, it could be just as popular if not more popular than TFT. These modes simply needed some fixes and more content, not necessarily a redesign of their base mechanics, which is the most important thing to get right, which they did. But that's the kicker. Time is money, and it takes a while to make this stuff. Riot has told us directly that the Star Guardian Invasion mode took over 4 months to make. That's a lot of time for just one map, two difficulties, a few champions, and reusing tons of assets from the base game. But my personal issue with this situation is that these modes prove to me that the one thing League of Legends has absolutely perfected is its gameplay. Now, if you just spat all over your keyboard, let me explain really quickly. Everybody hates ranked, we know that. Ranked League of Legends is the worst thing ever. But the game, the community, all of that stuff that's incredibly frustrating and toxic, that's not what makes this game good. Clearly, it's not. But I think what keeps us coming back to this game subconsciously all the time is that the core mechanics are amazing. It is so fun to play this game at its most bare bones level. It is fun as heck to throw a Lux Binding, land it, and then follow up with your ER and blow someone up. Something about using that combo is just so satisfying. There is something smooth about playing the new champion Gwen, or Yasuo, or Yone, or Zed, or Katarina. It's satisfying to have your E on cooldown as Ezreal, but then land all of your skill shots in a row while kiting backwards, only for your E to then come back up, because you earn that. The game itself is freaking good, but the way in which the game presents itself isn't. The characters and champions in this game are superb, distinct, fun to play, some are hard to master, some are easy to master, and the fluidity of the graphics and animations make us all addicted to playing it. And in a PvE setting, all of the game's raw mechanics, you don't lose any of it, you just get to see how good they really are. After the launch of Teamfight Tactics, Riot has told us that we will no longer get any new game modes, and we shouldn't expect anything from them anymore. The team that was responsible for alternate modes for these PvE events, as well as Darkstar, Poro King, etc., is now the team responsible for TFT. The point I'm trying to make is to not bash Teamfight Tactics, because I do enjoy it from time to time, but rather question Riot's motives, question why they are willing to have Teamfight Tactics be a all-the-time mode and keep it running, but not something like a PvE experience. But here's the thing, these modes aren't nearly as popular as we like to think. According to Riot, there has only ever been two game modes released that actually increased the pool of players, making more people be online and play the game than previously before that. With the launch of Teamfight Tactics in 2019 and Earth every time it comes back more or less, these are the only modes that ever made more people log into the League client. Every other game mode has just shifted the player base into separate buckets, if you will. A huge portion of players always try these modes, but then the drop off was substantial. On the last day of them being available, nearly every mode only accounts for 1-5% to of total game hours. Aside from Teamfight Tactics, they've told us that only Earth and One For All are even remotely popular by this standard. Earth has around 20 to 30% of game hours while it's live, and One For All having about 10 to 20% of game hours. Now this doesn't surprise me, and I knew that these modes were unpopular after weeks and weeks of playing it, but here's what I would like to consider. What if Riot took a PvE mode given an entire year of development, and instead of 4 to 6 months, they put even more time into it? Imagine a new PvE mode where this time we defended Ionia from the Noxian invasion and we had a lore accurate approach. We could use Ionian champions like Aurelia, Karma, Ken and Yasuo, Akali, and plenty of others and defeat the final boss as a super beefed up scion. But here's the thing, we could play through several different chapters or sequences upgrading each time. 
I'm not thinking along the lines of a round setup or a match setup, but rather one where it was more of a co-op campaign. The first level could start in the Ionian villages, where you need to defend the civilians, then you push back into the main battlegrounds, then to the forest, and finally you push the Noxians all the way back to where they came from after you defeat Sion. I guess it's important to remember that Riot has confirmed they are working on an MMO, and to be quite honest with you, I think that's the one thing they may not actually screw up. Riot's ability to maintain League of Legends is highly questionable, and that's sugarcoating them to be honest with you. Their balance team is, well, the balance team? But imagine if we had a polished MMO experience that utilized awesome PvE mechanics in raids. I mean, that might be one of the best games ever. I think it's really sad to see that they've killed off all of the alternate game modes, but to be 100% fair and again transparent, they've told us that these things didn't keep our attention. They have told us that less than 5% of the player base actually were playing them on the final few days of their release. That being said, a company as rich as Riot, it's also hard to give them the resources excuse. This isn't an indie game, even though we like to joke that it is. Let me know your thoughts on this entire situation and this video. I would love to know what your favorite modes are in League history, and what you think of the upcoming Riot MMO. Anyway, I appreciate that you made it all the way to the end. This one ran a little longer than I wanted it to, but nevertheless, I appreciate everything that you guys do, and I appreciate that you watched all the way to the end, like I said. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and a comment for the YouTube algorithm. It always helps me out and means a lot to me if you do that. Consider subscribing, and if you want to support this content and support me as a creator, please check out my Patreon. I have video editing tutorials over there if you're curious about the editing on these videos. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.